Amidst the vast expanse of history, as the echoes of the early Middle Ages began to wane, the High and Late Middle Ages rose, casting its distinct and transformative shadow over Europe. This era, marked by towering cathedrals and rigorous intellectual pursuits, also bore witness to a subtle yet profound undercurrent, the evolving perceptions and roles of women, and by extension, those deemed witches. A common misconception about history is its portrayal as a linear progression, with each epoch heralding more rights, more freedoms, and a better life for all. Such a view oversimplifies the complexities of societal evolution. As prior episodes on the Celts and the Norse have illuminated, women's rights and societal perceptions of them have always been in flux. While some epochs saw women empowered and revered, others witnessed their marginalization and persecution. The late Middle Ages in particular marks a poignant divergence from earlier eras, where women's roles and rights began to wane paving the way for intensified scrutiny and suspicion. Here, we navigate a world rife with contradictions. While the spires of Gothic cathedrals pierce the heavens, reflecting an age of faith and grandeur, down below, a growing cloud of suspicion and mistrust began to envelop women, especially those who strayed from societal norms or held esoteric knowledge. In this chapter, we journey through bustling medieval towns, the vibrant hum of trade fairs, and the hallowed halls of burgeoning universities. As the age unfolded, a palpable transformation permeated the very fabric of society, a shift from personal piety to institutional orthodoxy, mirrored by the ascent of scholasticism. Against this rich tapestry, we delve deep into the intricate dance of women's rights. Their roles, once revered and multifaceted, began to narrow and face scrutiny. No longer just the wise women or revered healers of yore, their identities became increasingly intertwined with the evolving, often ominous concept of witchcraft. As scholasticism's systematic approach began to dominate intellectual pursuits, the nuanced and diverse roles of women began their gradual decline, setting the stage for a dramatic transformation in the perception of witchcraft and its practitioners. Why is this exploration so pivotal? Because within these shifts lay the groundwork for the impending witch hunts, the dark chapter looming on the horizon. The perception of the witch was undergoing a dramatic metamorphosis, deeply influenced by the broader societal views on women. So join us on this enlightening voyage as we unravel the stories of resilience, transformation, and challenges faced by women and those labeled as witches. Through their eyes, we'll gain insights into the complex tapestry of belief, power, and identity that defined the high and late Middle Ages. If you are enjoying this, please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps me out. Thank you. The tapestry of the early and high Middle Ages was woven with threads of agency and autonomy, where women stretching beyond the domestic sphere were artisans, landowners, and spiritual guides. Their rights to own, inherit, and bequeath property often made them influential figures within their communities. Guilds, early incarnations of modern trade unions, weren't just male domains. Women flourished as artisans, merchants, and even guild masters, especially in bustling urban centers like Paris and London. And in the realm of spirituality, their voices resonated as mystics, abbesses, and hermits, while in the arts they emerged as patrons, creators, and authors. However, as the vibrant hues of the High Middle Ages gave way to the deeper shades of the late period, this narrative begins to shift. 
with the acceleration of commerce and urbanization during the Middle Ages, a substantial transformation was witnessed in economic and social structures. The growth of towns and cities led to an increased demand for goods and services. Markets expanded and trade networks sprawled, connecting distant regions and bringing diverse cultures into contact. Guilds emerged as powerful entities, essentially acting as trade unions and regulatory bodies. They controlled the production and sale of goods, set quality standards, and determined who could or couldn't trade. Initially, these guilds were mixed or had female-dominated counterparts, especially in industries like textile production. Women played an active role, often owning their workshops and training apprentices. However, as commerce grew in scale and complexity, larger capital investments became necessary. The financial model began to favor those who could invest more, leading to the concentration of economic power. Men, traditionally seen as the primary breadwinners and having access to larger networks, began to consolidate their influence within these guilds. Over time, the organizational structures of guilds became more rigid and male-centric. Women found it increasingly challenging to maintain their once influential positions. They were either relegated to less profitable niches or had to work under male relatives. Simultaneously, theological winds shifted direction. The church, once celebrating the tales of female saints and mystics, slowly veered towards more conservative interpretations of scriptures, often emphasizing narratives that portrayed women as sources of temptation. And then came the intellectual renaissance of the Middle Ages. The latter part of the Middle Ages saw an intellectual awakening. Often termed as the medieval renaissance, this period was marked by a revived interest in ancient Greek and Roman texts, advancements in philosophy, science, and theology, and the rise of universities as epicenters of learning. Universities, like those in Bologna, Paris, and Oxford, became magnets for scholars. These institutions, however, were deeply entrenched in ecclesiastical traditions. Given that the clergy was male-dominated, it's unsurprising that these early universities followed suit. Women were almost entirely excluded from formal academic pursuits. The reasons were manifold. Theological views that emphasized Eve's role in the fall of man, Aristotelian philosophies that presented women as misbegotten men, and societal norms that prioritized a woman's role as a homemaker and mother over that of a scholar. Yet, a curious contradiction emerges. Women, largely excluded from the hallowed halls of universities and formal academic pursuits, were nonetheless keepers of profound esoteric knowledge. Grimoires, books of magic and mysticism, sometimes authored by women, stood in stark contrast to the academic treatises of the universities. This duality highlights the diverse avenues of knowledge in the medieval world. While universities represented structured, ecclesiastical-approved knowledge, grimoires were the domain of the esoteric, the mystical, and the arcane. They were repositories of ancient wisdom, often passed down secretly through generations, away from the prying eyes of the church and societal elites. Yet, as the age progressed, even this realm of knowledge became a source of suspicion. The very grimoires that were once symbols of wisdom became evidence of heresy. In a rapidly changing world, any form of power or knowledge that women held, especially outside the sanctioned norms, was increasingly seen as a threat. This dichotomy serves as a poignant reminder of the complex interplay between knowledge, power, gender, and societal norms during the Middle Ages. 
While women had been celebrated spiritual visionaries and contributors to the monastic life in earlier periods, the rise of scholasticism prioritized a method of learning that was analytical, debate-driven, and based on written texts a mode less accessible to women who were often denied formal education. Female mystics, once revered, began to face skepticism and even condemnation from a clergy that was increasingly trained in scholastic theology. Over time, the gap widened. As universities became the primary centers for intellectual discourse, women's voices in theology, science, and philosophy were sidelined. The vast tapestry of knowledge of the age had fewer and fewer threads woven by women. Several factors intertwined in this intricate dance of change. The broadening of trade routes and the transition from local markets to expensive networks. The evolving stance of the church, influenced by theological debates, and the emergence of male-centric academic milieu all played their part. In this evolving narrative, the position of women shifted, reflecting the broader cultural, economic, and theological undercurrents of the age. Through the ebbs and flows of empowerment and marginalization, their journey paints a vivid portrait of a world in flux, offering insights into the winds of change that sculpted the medieval era. In the waning years of the Middle Ages, as the tapestry of society grew more intricate and complex, a shadow began to cast its dark silhouette across Europe, the specter of witch hunts. No longer were the accusations of maleficence reserved for the margins of society. They became a central concern, reaching feverish heights during the late Middle Ages and persisting well into the early modern period. As we've previously traced the shifting sands of women's rights, a connection emerges between their declining societal stature and their increasing vulnerability to accusations of witchcraft. But what underpinned this surge in witch hunts? A multitude of factors, each intertwined with the other, painting a multifaceted picture of a society in tumult. One significant shift was in the realm of spirituality. The Middle Ages began with a strong emphasis on personal piety, where individual experiences and connections to the divine held significant weight. However, as centuries unfolded, there was a marked transition from this personal piety to a more institutional orthodoxy. The church, ever growing in influence and power, sought to regulate and define the boundaries of acceptable belief and practice. Heresies were ruthlessly suppressed, and any deviation from the sanctioned norm was viewed with deep suspicion. Within this framework, practices that might have once been seen as benign or even beneficial, such as herbal medicine or folk rituals, came under scrutiny, often labeled as witchcraft. This tightening religious orthodoxy intersected with the declining rights and roles of women. As women found themselves increasingly marginalized, their traditional roles as healers, midwives, or wise women made them vulnerable targets. Their expertise, once valued, became a source of suspicion. In a world where they had less and less economic and social power, Accusations of witchcraft served as a tool to further diminish their influence and control. The gendered nature of these witch hunts cannot be overstated. The majority of those accused and persecuted were women, particularly those who defied societal norms. Widows, who existed outside the protective umbrella of male guardianship, the elderly, often seen as expendable or even burdensome, and those women who were outspoken or didn't fit neatly into societal roles, all became easy targets. Their vulnerability was not just a product of their gender, but was exacerbated by the intersection of economic, social, and religious factors. 
Economic pressures undeniably played a pivotal role in the persecution of alleged witches. The late Middle Ages in particular were marked by a series of crises that shook the very foundations of medieval society. The infamous Black Death, which wiped out a significant portion of Europe's population, was followed by subsequent outbreaks of the plague. These health catastrophes were accompanied by periods of famine caused by climate change, the so-called Little Ice Age, and agricultural challenges. Such calamities led to widespread societal anxiety. With limited scientific understanding, communities grappled for explanations for these seemingly apocalyptic events. In their quest for answers and a desire to exert some semblance of control over the uncontrollable, they often sought scapegoats. Accusations of witchcraft fit this bill perfectly. Witches, in the medieval imagination, were individuals who had made pacts with the devil and could therefore wield malevolent powers that brought about crop failures, diseases, and other calamities. But why were women, particularly marginalized women, the primary targets? As we've established, the declining role and rights of women made them vulnerable. In a patriarchal society, women without male protectors, like widows or those living alone, were especially at risk. Their lack of societal protection, combined with their traditional roles as midwives, healers, or wise women, roles that had brought them into close contact with birth, death, and illness, made them easy targets for blame. Furthermore, there was an economic dimension to these accusations. When someone was accused of witchcraft, their property was often confiscated by authorities or the church. In communities where resources were scarce, this presented a tangible benefit. For some, leveling accusations became a means to personal enrichment or settling old scores. This economic incentive combined with deep-rooted societal fears and the diminished rights of women, created a volatile mix ripe for persecution. Moreover, the theological framework of the time further exacerbated these issues. The church, seeking to strengthen its grip in the face of heresies and other challenges, propagated the idea of a vast diabolical conspiracy. Women often portrayed in religious texts as more susceptible to demonic temptations due to the legacy of Eve, were easy prey in this narrative. The very attributes that once elevated them as community healers and wise women now became evidence of their alleged pacts with the devil. Their intimate knowledge of herbs, healing practices, and other arcane arts, instead of being celebrated, became viewed with suspicion. In the larger societal picture, these witch hunts also served a purpose of control and reaffirmation of societal norms. In times of crisis, societies often retreat to conservative values, and the persecution of the other can be seen as a way to solidify group cohesion. Women, especially those who defied societal expectations or lived on the fringes, challenged these norms by accusing, trying, and often executing these women, society aimed to re-establish a sense of order amidst chaos. In this tempestuous climate, where religious orthodoxy, economic pressures, and social norms collided, women found themselves at the epicenter of suspicion and persecution. The escalating witch hunts of the late Middle Ages and early modern period serve as a grim testament to the intricate dance of power, fear, and societal change. As we delve deeper into the narrative, it's crucial to ask, how did these women view themselves? Were they knowingly defying societal norms, or simply continuing traditions handed down through generations? For many, the practices they engaged in were rooted in ancient traditions. These women often saw themselves as healers, midwives, or wise women providing essential services to their communities. Their knowledge of herbs, roots, and natural remedies was passed down through generations, an inheritance of ancient wisdom. They were, in many respects, the doctors, 
therapists, and pharmacists of their day. The people who sought their services were often those who couldn't afford or didn't have access to formal medical care, or those who preferred traditional remedies over the treatments offered by male physicians. However, there were others who tread a more esoteric path. Grimoires, books of magic that contained spells, invocations, and other arcane knowledge, were circulated in the medieval world. Some women might have had access to such texts or similar oral traditions, practicing rituals and spells that they believed could influence the world around them. These practices, while not always malevolent, were secretive by nature, given the risks associated with them. It's also worth considering the psychological dimension. For some of these women, their roles as healers or wise women gave them a sense of purpose and identity. The act of helping others or harnessing the powers of nature for healing and protection instilled a sense of empowerment, especially in a world that increasingly marginalized them. The line between folk traditions and what was considered witchcraft was often blurry. As societal views shifted, practices that were once seen as benign or even beneficial became dangerous, especially if they were outside the bounds of orthodox religious practices. In the face of persecution, why did these women continue their practices? Some undoubtedly believed in the power and efficacy of their rituals and remedies. Others might have been motivated by a sense of duty to their community or a desire to uphold traditions in the face of changing societal norms. And for some, it was likely a means of economic survival. In this age of flux, the self-perception of these women whether they saw themselves as guardians of ancient wisdom or practitioners of magic, paints a rich and complex picture. They were at once a product of their times and agents of change, navigating a world that was both fearful and in awe of their abilities. As the late Middle Ages transitioned into the early modern period, a new and potent tool of persecution emerged crystallizing and amplifying many of the anxieties and suspicions of the age, the Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches. Penned by the Dominican monks Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Sprenger in the late 15th century, this treatise became the definitive manual for witch hunters, inquisitors, and those who sought to root out the supposed evils of witchcraft from Christian society. But what was it about this particular work that gave it such lasting and devastating influence? Central to the Malleus Maleficarum was its scholastic inspiration of a methodical and systematic approach to identifying, trying, and punishing witches. It didn't just describe the alleged practices of witches. It linked witchcraft with heresy, making it not just a secular crime, but a grave religious transgression. In doing so, it intertwined the fear of witchcraft with the might of ecclesiastical and secular authority, giving both a powerful tool and mandate to act. Yet, its impact wasn't just in its meticulous detailing of witchcraft. The treatise was deeply misogynistic. It emphasized what the authors saw as the inherent weaknesses of women, their supposed proclivity towards evil, and their susceptibility to the devil's influence. One infamous line reads, For wickedness is but little or not at all found in the male sex, but because a greater abundance of wickedness has flowed from women than from men, as we learn in the first book of Kings, where Samuel says, I have nourished thy son, whom thou hast set over me, and lifted him up as a prince. And the old prophet says of the land of Israel, There are set over you women. Wherefore heresies, insomuch as they be witchcrafts, have arisen from women. Such statements entrenched and codified prevailing societal biases, giving them a veneer of religious and legal legitimacy. But 
the Malleus might have remained a relatively obscure text, were it not for a groundbreaking new invention, the printing press. Introduced to Europe by Johannes Gutenberg in the mid-15th century, the press revolutionized the dissemination of knowledge. No longer were texts limited to the few, painstakingly copied by hand. They could be mass-produced and distributed widely. The Malleus Maleficarum, one of the first books to be printed, became an unexpected bestseller. Its ideas, now easily accessible, spread like wildfire throughout Europe shaping perceptions and policies regarding witchcraft for centuries to come. In this convergence of religious zeal, misogyny, and technological advancement, the stage was set for an even darker chapter in the history of witchcraft persecution. As we look towards the horizon, the Malleus Maleficarum stands as a foreboding harbinger of what's to come, a bridge from the medieval to the early modern, from localized fears to a continent-wide witch craze. As we draw the curtain on part 7 of our series, which is a historical tapestry, we are left with a complex mosaic of beliefs, fears, and societal shifts that defined the High and Late Middle Ages. These were times of monumental achievements and harrowing persecutions. An illustration of the dual nature of humanity's progress. The towering spirals of cathedrals and the intricate debates in burgeoning universities were juxtaposed against a growing undercurrent of suspicion, one that disproportionately targeted women. These women, often standing at the crossroads of ancient traditions and societal norms, found themselves in a perilous dance balancing their roles as healers and wise women against the rising tide of fear and persecution. The Malleus Maleficarum, with its chilling methodology and dark implications, encapsulates the era's growing anxiety. Propelled by the revolutionary printing press, its influence spread, casting a shadow that would linger for centuries. It not only encapsulated fears of an age, but also amplified and standardized them, becoming a guidebook for persecution. Yet, as we reflect on this era, it's crucial to recognize the resilience and strength of those targeted. Their stories, often lost in the grand narratives of history, are a testament to human spirit and endurance. They navigated a world that was rapidly changing, where the very things that made them essential their knowledge, their skills, their spirituality, also made them targets. As we transition to the next chapter of this series, we carry with us the understanding that history is multifaceted, shaped by myriad forces, both visible and hidden. The witch hunts, while a dark chapter, also offer insights into the broader societal, religious, and economic dynamics of the age. The tale of the witch is not just one of persecution, but also of power, resilience, and the human capacity for both fear and reverence. It's a story that reminds us of the complexities of the past and offers lessons for the present and the future. So join us next time as we continue to unravel this tapestry, exploring the intricate interplay of belief, power, and identity in the chapters of history yet to come.